but I just really decided, you know, this is where my strength is and my pull is and practicing law is not it, you know? So I just kind of decided, okay, this is something I'm super passionate about, something that I really want to go for it. Welcome to the You Are Lawyer podcast, Elizabeth Larrick. How are you today? I am well, and I'm excited to be here. Yay, I am too. So we were just chatting before I started recording about books. We are both voracious readers. A lot of lawyers like to read, but we we really seem to be enjoying reading, and especially nonfiction books right now. Um, so Elizabeth, would you tell the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do as a lawyer? Yes, um, Elizabeth Larrick. I am in Austin, Texas, and I am a former litigator, ran my own law practice for plaintiff personal injury for about five years, then it took me a couple years to wind down, and then what I do now is I help lawyers with focus groups, witness prep, trial strategy, uh, basically litigators and trial lawyers who are going to take their cases uh, all the way to the courthouse or just get ready and prepare from the start of that filing litigation. Okay, so it sounds like consulting. Is that kind of what you're doing? Absolutely, yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, I love consulting because you get to set your own hours. I mean, of course, it's based on when they have trial prep, (laughs) right? But you get to be the expert. You get to come in, you get to bring your different perspective. Is that the part you enjoy about it? Absolutely. Anybody you talk to, it's always way more fun to work on somebody else's case than your own. And so that's what I found in in my practice. I was like, oh, I would so much rather help somebody else uh, go and find the flaws, find the blind spots and, and figure out ways to fix it and make it better. Yeah. Okay. So in that time of winding down when you left practicing, did you know you were going to do this or were you preparing to do something else and then you kind of missed the law or what happened? No, I always, um, so I worked at a couple places and then I went on my own, which is kind of a natural progression as a plaintiff's personal injury lawyer. And I always had focus groups. I'd always done them myself and they kind of started with a group of us getting together to do it, to kind of cut costs. And I'd always had occasionally somebody come to me and say, hey, can you help me with this like kind of difficult person? So I always had it there and it just kind of started to naturally grow. And the other side, you know, the practice of law was kind of not shrinking, but just not really growing either. And then I really decided, you know, okay, that's it. 2020, great year. I'm going to throw it down and like, this is what I'm going to do. And then the pandemic (laughs) And it was like, oh my gosh, what a, like a test, you know, clearly. But then I just basically kind of stopped, retooled and then put everything virtual. Um, And the virtual focus groups have really taken off as a much uh, more efficient, effective tool to use. And so that's kind of how it just kind of naturally, my talents were pulling me towards that focus group work, that consulting work uh, versus doing practice. Yeah, okay. So, I know you mentioned that a lot of times people will go from plaintiff's work to then running their own law firm. And I have seen that a lot, but it's a really big jump from being an employee or working at a big firm to being a business owner and having all the operations and management and that kind of stuff going with it. Do you enjoy that part about consulting now or did you have to learn or grow to to enjoy that aspect? Yeah. I mean, I think being a business owner was a huge total step in a different direction that I didn't have. I had little pieces along the way. I never worked for a really large firm. So like smaller firms, you're going to see more what's going on behind the scenes. So I had a lot of that building block already there when I started my business as a practice um, and really kind of took that, but also took the best parts of it. Right. So, you know, right now I'm at a place where I have a lot of contract workers that are helping me get things done. Um, and not, and then, you know, slowly, hopefully turning towards building, you know, an in-house team to help me do what I do. But, um, I found out I really enjoy the business side of things. Like I love reading business books and I love getting into all that stuff. Um, but you know, it's, it's also kind of a slow growth, slow learning curve too, as well. Yeah, absolutely. So have you read any books by Donald Miller? I don't think so. What? Oh, what can, get, give yes. me one. 
he had business made simple is so good. And he literally is like, yeah, you need a website, but like, these are the four things you really need on your website. And then it, it's really, really, it's, it's great. <laughs> Check out Donald Miller, business made simple. He also created like a story brand, like how to take your story and turn it into a, a quick story guide. Like, um, and then he has marketing made simple. And both of those are really, really good. Nice. Um, it will- just cuts through the fluff. He's, he's a really good writer to just get to like what you need. Yes. And I like, I will tell you, uh, uh, you know, our connection with Sheila uh, Wilkinson, but, and, and I've told her, I was like, if there's one thing I could give back to people, especially local lawyers opening their own business would be like all the things that I did wrong <laughs> that I didn't need to do that really kind of tripped you up. So I, I will definitely look for those books and because I mean, sometimes it's just that one little nug that you need from that book that helps you get to the next level. Yeah. His books are really good. I like to listen to them on audiobook first. And then if I find myself writing too many notes, I'm like, okay, just go buy it and write in the margins <laughs> because they're really good. They're really, really good. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, I found that the whole business part of going out on your own, even in managing this podcast and running it and getting sponsors and all that good stuff, it it was different, but not in a bad way, right? It was a little bit more creative, a little more right brain than what I was used to when I was working in house at a, at a big law firm. Do you think being a lawyer, mm, what's the question I have? I I would say like on your creative thought, like that's what I missed so much about practice. And that's what I love so much about what I do. Um, Because, you know, at the time when I opened my business, it was everyone needs to blog and you need to be blogging and like you have to do it. And so I was like trying to create there and it's just, you know, I do enjoy writing and that was like kind of thing. But when somebody said do a podcast, I was like, oh, absolutely. Oh, and then the focus groups and like the visual aids, like that really was a place where I was like, oh, I feel so much more creative here than I do trying to pound out some discovery or create some depot questions to try and catch somebody. So the podcast came first and then you started on this? The podcast came about two years ago. So my, I've had, you know, my firm and trying to blog for, <laughs> that was, that was a uh, several, several years ago. So, but, uh, and I just finally, um, Brandon, Ernie, the attorney, he has his own podcast and he was like, you know, it's a little easier for lawyers just to talk <laughs> than it is sometimes to, to, to write things. So. Yeah. In fact, yeah, that's actually very true because a lot of lawyers love to talk. <laughs> Most lawyers, but even if you're like an introvert, you typically enjoy talking. Um, and then we like to research. We like all of that aspects, which I think plays well into being a podcaster. Um, so Elizabeth, your show is called Trial Lawyer Prep. How do you find time to manage that and record for that podcast? I think it's probably the same way most people try to get things done, which is time block. I mean, I I have to be really regimented about, okay, like there was always a time on my calendar for, hey, on Tuesday afternoons, like I'm going to do a couple episodes. Um, And I'm the person who I like to write it out, you know, write out what the the things are and then just get the flow and then kind of talk it out on the, on the recording. Um, And I've actually was doing every week of releasing. And then I kind of switched just recently to every other to really kind of dial back and really kind of hone in on okay, my content and like being really, really precise. And so that's helped me kind of set that time block up and then really think through. Okay. Yeah. So back to the creative part, <laughs> you were like, yeah, everybody said you got to create a blog, but you did make the blog. What was that like? And how long did you write it yourself before you kind of outsourced that part? I didn't. I, well, I'm sure again, most lawyers, when you decide to run a business, there are all kinds of vendors that want to help you do all kinds of things. Um, Some of them are inexpensive. Some of them are expensive. And so, you know, when you're vetting out there, you don't really know. So I went through many different, like, oh, I'll do this person. I'll do that. Use that person to write my blogs. And eventually I did find somebody who was more like an editor. Like she was like, took my content, edited it. And I did that for almost a year. And she helped me do the, my email list versus my blogging. But I just kept running into people 
just recycling. Then I guess it's before AI, by the way, like people were just recycling. And I was like, I just found this blog on three other lawyers' websites. Like that's, you know, so I, I didn't do, I was not very consistent with my blogging and I pretty much just kind of let that go by the wayside. You know, I still have a blog on my website, but it's nothing like, you know, consistent that I am with the podcast. Yeah, I gotcha. So I'm, the reason I asked about the blog is because I started this podcast August, I'm not sure, April 2020, and I wanted it to be a blog. And my husband was like, okay, you're going to record with people and write it, you know, record it anyway, so that you can come back and write the notes. Why don't you just make it a podcast? And I'm like, podcast? Nobody has a podcast. That was for famous people. This was four years ago. And he's like, no, I think you should try. And so I think it's funny because, yeah, everyone was pushing blogs really, really hard. <laughs> and so I took the same idea, but instead made it the podcast. And it was really hard for me to jump over to to give myself permission to be creative. That's how I'm going to say it. Did you have any of that where you were like, okay, I know what it means to be creative when I'm practicing law. How am I going to make that creativity transfer into my other interests? I mean, I think if you go to law school, we get taught to basically teach other people what we know. Right. And so to go on the blog, I mean, to go on the podcast for me was like, super easy to go on 15 minutes, me talking about something I actually, I love and I'm passionate about what I have tried to do now is just like turn that a little bit more into not necessarily, cause a lot of people just, they know about focus groups and mock trials. They just don't know, like, and I just, you know, like most lawyers, we get in the weeds like that. You give us two, you give us a topic, we're getting the weeds. Like <laughs> so I get in the weeds all the time on my podcast, but, um, I think it's, you know, it's, helpful and you know in learning to podcast and i'm sure that you found this too like having some organization really helps your listeners and like and so i tried to do that last year where i was really focused on uh spending the first six months of 2023 on trial and having interviews with people with trials and kind of what people are seeing and doing uh, post pandemic so that's helped me be creative i just i mean it's kind of like the way that you do it like it's so much easier to be just have a conversation with somebody and have some topics, but really kind of get into organically just having a conversation with, with somebody else who has the same, you know, same, same lawyer brain, same training that, that we all do. I gotcha. I gotcha. So quick suggestion for you. I think you should take some of your podcasts and just transcribe them and put them up as blogs. Yes. Well, so that's what I was going to do, but Apple's doing it automatically. I just listen do it that apple's going to do it automatically um and i actually started to do um so you know because sometimes i get thinking about focus groups and i get all up in the weeds uh doing my case study so what i've tried to do is i do my short blog i mean i do my short podcast and then i do my long you know type out of my of my case study so i've started to do that this year to hopefully be like, okay, like, here's what I said there. That's the short version. If you want to get in the weeds with me, come read, come read the blog. Okay. I love it. I love it. Um, I actually help people like manage their podcasts and even launch podcasts because there are so many lawyers that love it. And I started last year and I was just like, here come the lawyers. And here came all the doctors. I have an eye doctor. I have a dermatologist, <laughs> I have a, a ear, note, and throat doctor who wants to have a podcast. And I was like, do doctors listen to podcasts? But clearly they do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I get it. I get it. Um, it is hard to kind of find that time to do it, but then it is important because there are a lot of podcasts about trial prep, but they're not all going to have your perspective, right? They're not all going to have your expertise. Your voice will still be needed, even though there are other shows. So yeah. And I think it's, I mean, and I'm sure you've gone through this too, where it's like you kind of go in one vein for a while and then you're like, oh, you come over here. And so it's loose enough to get to move around if you, you know, get excited about a certain thing that's happening or something happens in the world that, you know, everyone's really focused on. It really gives a little bit of, you know, leeway, but I mean, lawyer podcasts are pretty rare. Like, I mean, so that's kind of the cool thing too, is like you were in the forefront of getting one out there, you know, and consistency is key. So it's, I think it's really awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Elizabeth, 
In preparing for the show, I saw that you actually took and passed two bar exams, the Texas bar exam in Oklahoma. Where did you go to law school? And I know you're in Austin now, but what brought you back to Texas or what? Yeah, I went to law school at University of Oklahoma and um, graduated right after the mortgage bust. Uh, so it was, you know, kind of a little bit of a competition for, for jobs. Um, and I found a job in Oklahoma City, worked for another three years. Um, I'd always had the plan to come back to Texas, but, you know, was kind of waiting for the job market to come back. But then I got really impatient, <laughs> as you do. And I just said, oh, shoot, I'm just going to come back and I'll just take the, I'll just take the Texas bar. Um, and my sister was living in, in Austin, Austin area. So that's what brought me back to Austin. Okay. All right. Very cool. I've been to Austin before. It's a great food city. There's a lot of options. Yes. There. Lots yes. of food, lots of things to do all like every weekend. There's something going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of fun down there. I'm sure it's a lot warmer than here in Ohio. It's like <laughs> eight degrees outside. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, it's going to be in the seventies today. So well, I'm jealous for that, but <laughs> so Elizabeth, okay. So you worked for a couple of years, transitioned, and now you're doing your own thing. What would you say to younger lawyers? So five years practicing or less or law students about all the things they can do with their law degrees? I love this question, by the way, like, I, I, because I, when I went to school, we didn't like there wasn't a lot of platforms to go look to see what you could do. You just, you kind of had an idea going in and that's what I had. Um, but I'm always amazed like, Oh wow. Like that person was a lawyer and that person was a lawyer. And I want to do that thing. Like that seems so cool. So, you know, the sky's the limit. And whenever I talk to anyone who's thinking about going to law school, I just say, you know, you're going to get in and they're going to tell you like, here's, you know, get you really focused in and tunnel vision on like what lawyers do. But, you know, the world is, you know, every place needs a lawyer. Any, I mean, it's, it's, I'm always like, oh, wow. And you don't have to be a practicing lawyer, but they want that brain. You know, we get that training in that brain. Um, so, you know, if you're thinking about going to do, oh, I'm going to do something international, or I want to do something in fashion, or I want to do something, you know, like every place needs, needs that lawyer brain. So there's always going to be a position for somebody with a law degree. So, uh, you know, and of course, in all true lawyer fashion, like, you know, we could always use a few more lawyers in the world, especially female lawyers, but yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, we do have our own voice, our own unique perspectives onto things. Um, I love that, Elizabeth. Thank you. So I'm going to jump around because I keep thinking about this and you kind of touched on it, but I just want a little bit more detail. So you said you wanted to start your own business and then... It happened to be 2020 in the pandemic and you had to pivot and make everything virtual. What made you decide, you know what, I'm going to create this. And how did you start to even promote it? Like, did you, you know, go the traditional way and get the business cards? And you're like, I'm going to tell people I have a focus group and then explain to them what that is. Or what was the evolution of your business? Um, well, when I started my, my law firm in 2015, I was already kind of doing them along the way. And so people were already coming to me knowing, oh, when are you doing this? When are you doing this? And so I already had kind of a built-in audience for it. Um, of course, at the time it was all in person though, right? So it's kind of like, there's a little bit of a limitation there on, on being able to do it. But I did have a little bit of following, you know, as far as that audience goes, but I just really decided you know, this is where my strength is and my pull is and, you know, practicing law is not it, you know? So I just kind of decided, okay, I really want to go for it. You know, this is something I'm super passionate about, something that I think I can make it work, uh, you know, as I transition out of, of doing law work. And so that's kind of where I just said, okay, that's it. And I did, um, completely redo my website at that time, which actually coincided with ending a contract <laughs> with my website designer. So I got a fresh new website, you know, totally revamped, but I hadn't really gotten into even like marketing or doing like any major polls or email lists or anything like that. Cause again, I, I just was like, Oh, I'm going to do this. And here's the website. And then March. <laughs> so um, and then at the time I was working with, um, a mastermind group, um, and they were just, you know, so encouraging and so helpful. And she just said, you know, you've 
got to at least try this before you say no, no one's going to do this. And I tried it and I was like, okay, it's rough, <laughs> but you know, keep going. And, and, and people, lawyers really were just like, yeah, this, this works and it's way more efficient and it's way easier than trying to do something in person. And so, um, it's just taken off since then. Yeah. I love that. So it was easier. It worked. And then it was easier than doing something in person, but then also everyone needed virtual stuff anyway. Right. A lot of the plaintiffs work and, um, non-criminal work, trial work was being virtual. So it made sense that you had already had that training and that experience and it kind of pivoted to being virtual. Yeah. And it's, I think, think we didn't know if it was going to stick around or not, but I mean, that's really still how people are taking depositions. So preparation is not a stretch to do prep on zoom. You know, it's sometimes a little easier to get the group of people you need from that venue on, on zoom versus just trying to pull them into, you know, a conference room on a, on a Friday afternoon. So. Gotcha. Yeah. So <laughs> when I hear the phrase focus groups, I immediately think of that show bull. And how he was putting together like the fake jury so that they could kind of test people. They would, you know, they'd be like, okay, we have this kind of a case, a car accident case. What kind of jurors would be sympathetic to this? And what kind of think about that? Is that kind of what you do? That is much more like what a jury consultant does. Um, so I'm a little bit more like we start out from the very jump to try to figure out, okay, what are the attitudes, assumptions, but also what are they seeing that you just aren't in your lawyer brain seeing? And what is it, for example, we had um, a group that had some hotly contested uh, car wreck and it was, you know, 80 to 20 when we started and we did about four focus groups. We got it down to 50, 50, which is pretty good. So they basically were retooling and looking and re fashioning their, you know, facts and what they had and putting their strongest arguments. And they did eventually go to trial and they got it down to 20% at trial. So yeah, so it's a little bit more about case framing and and, and really, and jury selection is kind of part of it, but, you know, really in the grand scheme of things, 2% of cases go to trial. So what really people need to focus on is like getting prepared, like retooling and getting everything ready before you get there so that, you know, you, you're, you've got all your ducks in a row. Yeah, I think that's brilliant because lawyers enjoy research, right? So it's kind of like you're A-B testing to see which argument would be better getting that practice. And then when you go to trial, it ends up being, or, you know, sometimes it ends up being even better than the way you practiced. So I like that. Yeah. So it's a, it's a ton of research. Yeah, exactly. You, you're figuring out and people are just dissecting your case and your facts and uh, lawyers just, you learn so much more because our brains are not fashioned that way. So it's like, oh, let me get an outside perspective to see what would be best. Yes. Okay. Very cool. All right. So Elizabeth, I'm going to, I'm going to put these in different order and then I'm going to put that last question about what can you do with your law degree here? So sure. I'm being, in my own mind, I'm moving it around <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because I'm going to move that way up to when I, when we were talking about what you're doing now. All right, cool. Um, so I always capture our goodbyes for the recording. Um, and I know this feels like kind of abrupt, but I had already gotten that last question out. So it'll make sense when you hear it. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, I'm going to capture our goodbyes and then I'll stop the recording and I just have like two or three housekeeping things and then we'll be done. All okay. Right. Okay. All right, Elizabeth. Well, thank you so much for sharing with everyone. Where can they find you? What's your website? Uh, you can find me at lyriclawfirm.com. That's L-A-R-I-C-K law firm. Or you can follow me on LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest place. Uh, that's where I talk a lot about focus groups and uh, that podcast too is Travel Lawyer Prep. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of You Are Lawyer. Today's special guest was Elizabeth Larrick. And Elizabeth, I will talk to you later. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.